What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Made You a Mixtape podcast. Welcome to the latest episode. I'm your host, Jason. With me today, good friend Katie Caldwell. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> Katie, uh, you, you've, you've, you're involved in a lot of different things. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what, what you do? Oh, God. <laughs> what an interesting question, because the pandemic, like many of us, I had to pivot quite a bit. Um, Pre-COVID, I was hosting and producing live hockey shows so the uh, with Puck Talks. So I was the Western Canadian correspondent. So I would do the shows from Vancouver to Winnipeg. And it turns out when a global pandemic hits and you work in live events and sports, you become non-essential, like hilariously quick. I will be the last person to go back to work. <laughs> so yeah, I lost my job when that hit. And it was kind of cool because I started freelancing for Sportsnet 650 in Vancouver. They reached out to me. I've always been really nervous on a microphone. And Wes, you know this, that as soon as I went to school, the first day of editing class, I went, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm meant to do. <laughs> so I gravitated towards the behind the scenes of the sports broadcasting industry but I keep getting forced onto a microphone. Because <laughs> you're kind of good at it, you know? So. <laughs> oh, thank you. But yeah, it definitely ties in with my anxiety, but it's good. It's a good challenge. It's been really fun. But yeah, Craig McEwen, the program director for 650, reached out and said, well, everyone else is broadcasting from home. So it's your turn, kids. So <laughs> I'm kind of the piece that steps in when people take time off. So that's been really nice because I've never done radio before. But yeah, that's been really fun. So I'm doing a bit of that. Um, a guest on many podcasts. <laughs> that's been, I have another one later today. It's kind of like an always a bridesmaid, never a bride vibe with podcasts. Lately. <laughs> well, uh, tell you what, been, when, when you host your own podcast, you give us a call. <laughs> oh, sweet. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> and I do a bit of work with Galvanize. It's a program through Laura Oakman, one of the biggest legends in sports broadcasting history. Uh, she's with Fox Sports. She's the third longest running NFL sideline reporter and just an overall legend. So yeah, we do some pretty cool work that I'm sure we'll get into uh, later. Right now we're working with the PWHPA, the women's hockey alliance that formed after um, the CWHL folded. Uh, but typically we work with NFL rookies. So it's been kind of cool to cross over to hockey with that. Now you talked about, you know, doing live shows with, um, you know, with, with Puck Talks Live and now you're doing all these podcasts and shows and reporting from, from home. How has that transition been from going from that, that live experience of talking hockey, you know, in front of a group of people to now talking sports, basically in the comfort and isolation of your own home? It's a good question because it's obviously two totally different experiences, but a lot of the feelings are paralleled where, you get that huge rush. And then the moment right before I step onto a microphone, every single time I go, what am I doing? Do I even know what I'm going to say? Like I get this panic moment. And then of course, as soon as you start, everything's fine. But I get that same feeling right before it starts where I'm like, oh, I think I just need to quit my job. This is too much. But of course, <laughs> that's the sweet spot of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. But it's really, really different when like the feeling is so much more tangible when you're in a group of people because the pressure, you can see people physically looking at you. And when you're recording for radio and it's just you, like I'm sitting here and all of the rush comes, all of the butterflies, and then the show ends. And then I close my laptop and I'm, I look down and I'm like, okay, hey, I'm in my sweatpants. My dog is right beside me. Like, it's just, it's just such a totally different experience of it's the same rush, but the environment is so different that sometimes you almost need to remind yourself of the magnitude of what you're doing because it's so easy to just sit there and go, yeah, I'm just sitting there shooting the shit with my friend on a radio show, but then you forget, oh, many, many people can hear this <laughs> in the Vancouver region. So yeah, it's been an interesting challenge and it's one that I, I almost have a hard time describing it just because it's so intense, but then there's also that really distinct comfort of home and being in your slippers. <laughs> but of course, with it comes some of the funniest stories that a lot of us have felt. Like one of my first shows, 
someone came and delivered a package. So knocked on the door. So of course my lovely golden retriever, Carl, he starts going ballistic. So he's barking and he's running the door. And I'm like, I'm trying to talk about Jay Beagle on the power play and like, <laughs> or on the penalty kill. And all of this is happening. And it's just those moments of, and then you just have to say like the joys of broadcasting from home, because it's just, there are all these kind of new funny challenges that we hadn't really thought of before. So now I have a sign that goes on the door that says for the love of God, under <laughs> no circumstances will you knock on the door. <laughs> but yeah, I, it's pretty funny. It's just different challenges. I, I can completely relate. Uh, on the other side of my door, uh, there's actually one of, you know, those uh, those glow boxes that you get at like the Walmart mm-hmm. and all that you put the letters in. I've basically taken one of those, put it on the door and it says on air. So it's on right now. So if everyone knows, nice. like, if the light is on, don't go into the room. Um, <clears throat> oh, that's so much nicer than a passive aggressive message just right? written on the door. <laughs> well, it's it's when I, I change the letter to stay out, then the message gets, gets real. Um, nice. The interesting thing too, is that people have adapted to broadcasting mm-hmm. from home, whether it be radio, whether it be TV, and it's almost become the norm. Do you see it actually going back to the way it was when the pandemic is completely over? It'll never go back to the exact way that it was. And I graduated from CSM in 2017. And a big part of the learning that we did in school was A lot of the teachers I remember saying, we're in this transition period right now, and we don't necessarily know where it's going to go, but everything is kind of shifting digitally. And the days of sports center, just, it just feels like we're getting so much further away from that. A, because of technology, B, because of our attention span and just being able to log onto Twitter and then see an instant highlight and instant reaction. It's like not as many people have the attention span or the schedule to sit down and watch an hour of sports highlights. So we were already kind of aware of that in school in 2017, but now I feel like all of us are realizing kind of the grand scheme, how many meetings could have been an email where I'm able to broadcast out of Vancouver from home. Why would I move to Vancouver and spend 10 times in rent and this and this and this and get in a car and wait in traffic and all of these things that we're realizing, like, yes, we were all forced into this, but now we see that it works. And there are the little quirks that we talked about, but everything was digital or shifting so digitally to begin with that I feel like this was the big push that we all needed where, and not just in our industry, in different ones all across the board, that a lot of people can work from home and then just... The emergence of things like TikTok, of Clubhouse, just all of these different means of communicating with each other and getting your voice and your content out there. Everything is just shifting so much that I I don't see a world where we go back. Like, obviously, there's a lot of things we would love to go back to. Things like live events, live shows, whichever that you just can't recreate from home. But I would be really, really shocked if it went exactly to how it was before. And I can imagine too, um, you, you have to think for the, for those who don't know, when reporters cover, you know, a, a game, the, the game is done, the athletes go back to their dressing room. And then, you know, after a bit, all the reporters go into the dressing room, surround mm-hmm. them and stick microphones in their faces. Is that going to happen again? Or are we going to go back or stick with the, here's your player, they're on Zoom and you can basically like zoom in and, you know, do all your post game there. It's a really, really good question. And I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I've been in one of the groups where you run into the locker room, except I was holding the camera, not the microphone, but there's an energy inside of that locker room that you just can't create through zoom. And I feel like it might be a bit of a battle where on the media side, we will be pushing for that room access. And I feel like on the team stance, they're going to be pushing for less access Mm -hmm. because they probably prefer the zoom where it's not all of us running in there, but there's something really, really magical about a locker room. And sure. You get great interviews on zoom, whichever, like the fact that we can do this right now, I'm in BC, you're in Toronto is really, really special, but there's something different about it being in person. And I think with sports, the magnitude of sports, there's so much intensity and I was in a pretty fun market. It was the Nashville Predators, which is A, it's a hockey team, but B, it's a party. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. there, yeah, there was just something really special um, and, and just feeding off the other media members that you're there with. And this is something not a lot of people realize. A lot of the cool conversations that are really memorable happen when the conversations aren't rolling. Like when you're standing there and 
Pecorine and I could have just this cool kind of chat about practice search ever. And it's just, you get those little moments that really, really connects the media with the players Mm -hmm. because that's shifted so much on its own. Like I remember, and that's just with, with technology changing, whichever. And then just with like the relationship between player and media used to be a lot different years and years ago where maybe like oftentimes they'd go for drinks on weekends, things like that. Whereas now it is a lot more professional, but I, I gravitate so much towards the human side of sports rather than the statistics and whichever, like the broads cast, one of my favorite podcasts in Vancouver will say no stats, just vibes. <laughs> <laughs> but so much of that you get from the relationships that you have with the players and that it's just not the same over Zoom. It's really not. Now you talked about Nashville. When the Predators came into the league, um, it was one of those things where you sit there and go hockey in Nashville. And the, mm-hmm. initially you sit there and go, how is that going to fit? Cause you saw, you know, league, you know, teams in Atlanta just not be able to make it. You know, the question was always, how is that going to make it? Nashville has one of the coolest vibes of any mm-hmm. hockey team in the NHL. Uh, so what was your role with the predators and how was that vibe during that year? So I started with them at a really, really cool time because it was right after their cup run. I started that off season. So they were like the shiny, pretty young thing that <laughs> people all of a sudden across North America are going, oh, holy crap, they actually care about hockey in Smashville. That was when the emergence of Smashville became on a more global stage. But I didn't realize until I moved down there that hockey's been big there for a long time. And I thought that it was one of those situations where, oh, they go on a cup run and then people realize, oh, this is pretty fun. I should take part of it. And then when you become a part of that community, like that team is such a family, I can't even describe it. But you get to know the season ticket holders and everybody embraces you so much. And I would I was having challenging hockey conversations with fans that have had season tickets for 18 years. And it was just something that. I had no idea. And I feel like so many of us didn't realize that we thought the beginning of Smashville was when they made their huge cup run. It had existed for a long time before that. And they've been competitive for a long time. Not, not Mm -hmm. now. What a disaster that's been. But David Poyle, he, he's such a magician of a GM that they were, they were always not just sneaking into the playoffs. They were getting into the playoffs first, second, second round and then and then they'd be out and it's you you never thought of them again because nashville was never synonymous with being a strong hockey market and so when i moved down there it was just it it totally blew me away and the whole culture of that place is just the coolest like i remember sean their ceo slash president i was just i was an intern there but it was funny because it i hate even using the term intern because i was working like 60 hour weeks. Like it was, (laughs) it was, it was so much responsibility, but it was just, it was, we were such a family. It was so cool. But on one of my first days, he came around and was chatting with me and then we went for lunch and he wanted to ask all about me and my story. And then, so I, sorry, all over the place. I get so excited about Nashville. (laughs) I, the broadcast department was a really, really small family. I kind of was a jack of all trades with that. So shooting, editing, Um, I was comfortable doing sit down interviews. So a lot of the staff in our department that's because the on air staff was pretty, we were in the same department, but it was different than. Okay. We might have to cut some of this. (laughs) (laughs) So say like Terry crisp, Chris Mason, Hal Gale, they were the people that were on air and then we were the ones behind the scenes. So out of the behind the scenes group of us, I was the one that was most comfortable being on air. So I was kind of thrown into doing our interviews that they weren't doing. I say again, so, good on the mic. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it, it was a cool and just a really fun challenge, but it's like we, you have your Monday to Friday, nine to five. And then on game days, you have that day on top of it. So it was a lot of hours and a lot of work, but it was just one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. And Still to this day, like if I'm down in Nashville, I have a press pass for Bridgestone because they just have accepted me as forever being a part of the family and that culture, that environment. And like Vegas puts on a good show now. Nashville was the original. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that that truly kicked that off. Like they're the ones that have live music at intermissions and just they keep it so on brand, but they've pushed a lot of boundaries of just we're music city. How much can we push that with the NHL to where we can give the experience of being music city? And they have, they've nailed it. So 
yeah, that's been one of the coolest things ever to be part of that family. And while you were down there, you talk, you talk about it being, of course, Music City. How mm. was the vibe musically while you were down there? Man, that place, I lived in East Nashville, which is my favorite part of that city, because a lot of people will go there for your bachelorette parties and then go there <laughs> for four days and only hang out on Broadway, which Broadway's fun for one night. It's just a row of bars and every single bar has three stories and usually there's a live band on each story. So like I would go for lunch and instead of just going for a lunch, a normal lunch break, I'm walking down Broadway. I would usually sit at the park across from Nissan stadium where the Titans play at the end of Broadway, there's a little patch of grass there. So I'd usually walk down there and you're just walking by a bunch of drunk people and just live tunes. And just there, there's this energy to it that is so, so infectious. And I, there were so many moments where I'd be walking down the street going, how is this my life right now? <laughs> like, and also I desperately wish I could pop in and have a beer at every single one of these places. <laughs> but for anyone listening that hasn't been in Nashville, or if you haven't want to go back, leave Broadway for the love of God, leave Broadway, <laughs> because the coolest part, like, and it's amazing. There's so much talent along that row, but they're all cover bands. They're all and cover bands are great. They serve their purpose. You're in a cover band. That slaps. I've seen your show. <laughs> but, like, nothing against the cover bands here. <laughs> no, no, I am so pro cover band because there's a time and a place for that where you want to scream and dance and sing and all of that. But so that's what Broadway serves its purpose for. But then you go away and that's why East Nashville is my favorite. You go into some dingy little basement and it's oftentimes just one person or what's called a writer's round where there'll be three or four of them on a stage or in a circle and they go back and forth and explain the story of how they wrote that song and then play the song them and their one instrument and then it goes to the next person. And that's the, those are the ones that just, that fuels my soul because those are the people you'll hear on the radio in three years. Those aren't the ones that are famous yet, but that's how they get their start is by doing these writer's rounds. And you sit there and you listen to the story of how the song happened. And then it goes into the song and to hear the passion in the song after hearing the story of how and why it was created and why it's so meaningful to the artist. That's Nashville. That's the Nashville that you can't get anywhere else. And that's what I want to encourage to people of. Yes, spend your night on Broadway, go drink your face up, up, up and down that street, but then go to the basement, go to five spot, go to like all of these different spots that are just this little, little venue. That's the true magic of Nashville. That's what I missed. And I was lucky enough to live with a producer and two artists. So I was the black sheep of our family where I was in sports, but everyone was a musician. Like we had a music room in our house that people would record in. So I'd be sitting watching football on NFL Sundays and people would be recording right beside me. And I'm sitting there going like, this is the dream right here. <laughs> right. Which, yes, I now want to have a music room in my house with, you know, complete with recording oh, cool. studio. Right. That right. was so good. Uh, were there any acts down there that you saw? Like, obviously, like, it's one thing to go see the big band at the, you know, at the big arena or whatever. Mm -hmm. But every now and then you stumble upon a club. And there's someone playing there or there's a band playing there and it's stuff you've never heard. It's not on the radio. Maybe it's not mm. even recorded, but it's just so amazing. And it's just that small group and you kind of, you know, you kind of take in that magic. Were there any of those moments while you were down there and just like, why is no one heard of this person or this band? Mm -hmm. God, so many of them. And oftentimes it wasn't bands because a lot of the bands that I saw were cover bands. Oftentimes it was just the one artist in the writer's round. So that was almost more impactful because it's just one person and one instrument. And then, like I said, them telling the story. It was really cool because I had an, an interesting mix of either the big, because I worked at Bridgestone Arena, oftentimes I would come back from lunch and because I was unpaid, I think they wanted to give me ways of being paid. So they would mm -hmm. just be like Jay-Z tickets on my desk when I came back. And it was one of those moments of like, oh, this is the coolest. <laughs> so, I, so I was so lucky. So this just happened? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just things like, things that you couldn't experience a lot of places where like there, there was a span where I was seeing Chris Stapleton on average every two weeks because there would be one day I'm coming into work and they're doing their setup and he's, and it's just him and I, and there were moments where I couldn't really tell anybody this there, but I'd step into the bowl on my way into work and then and it was me and then their band setting up 
and that's it. And he's just strumming on the guitar. And I'm like, one, another moment of how is this my life right now? Mm-hmm. Go to my desk, do the work or whichever. And then two nights later, go to the concert. And then I was able to see him another time. And it was just like seeing these big artists that everyone's heard of was so, so cool. And that was super fun. But the biggest thing that I do take out of Nashville is seeing just that one solo artist with their mm-hmm. one instrument. Like one of my roommate, her name is Katie Offerman, who I'm so excited. She's about to blow up. She oh, nice. just signed with Universal and she's writing and recording with them right now. And so she's one. And I was able to meet some really cool people through her. Like Matt Koziel is one that I'll never forget. Um, have you heard of Donovan Woods? I Wiss? haven't actually, no. Okay, so Donovan Woods is a beautiful, stunning Canadian artist. And I was lucky. I met him in Toronto the first time. And then I met him when I moved down there again. It was funny because I moved in and the first thing my roommate says to me is, oh, you're Canadian. Do you know Donovan Woods? And it was that moment of enforcing every Canadian stereotype where I burst out (laughs) laughing. And I said, I had a beer with him like three weeks ago (laughs) (laughs) because he goes back between Toronto and Nashville. So... I went to the Bluebird only one time. It's really hard to get in there, but I went to, so for the people that don't know what the Bluebird is, it's like the original Bluebird Cafe. The show Nashville is actually written about it, but that's the, one of the true writer's rounds where there's, it's this old cafe and there's four people in the middle and they sit in their circle and they go around the circle. But Donovan Woods, who plays sold out stadiums, he was in the writer's round. And then there was another um woman from lindsay ontario named madison so it was there were two canadians in the writers round which was just a cool <laughs> moment of pride like 50 percent of the people are canadian and it was it was just such a cool thing to experience but yeah it's hard there are so many artists that and i'm starting to hear on the radio now where it's like oh cool i saw you at the five spot or i saw you there because it, but then also two whiz there are so many that never blow up and never make it because they're just, it's so saturated with mm-hmm. insane and unbelievable talent. And that's the thing. You have, you have to think that, you know, you know, it's the cliche, you know, for an actor to make it in Hollywood, they have to go to Hollywood, you know, for mm-hmm. a, a TV actor to make it in TV, they, they, they have to go to New York. Right. And for a country music star to make it in country music, they have to go to Nashville. Exactly. You know, how many, how, how many artists are down there just, you know, deservedly need, you know, need to be heard, but just may never get that chance because they're in the oversaturated market. That's a really, really good question. And it's, there's no one there that's not stupid talented. It's so crazy because everywhere you go, like, even if you go out for dinner, a lot of places, like there'll be, there's live music quite literally everywhere in Nashville and every single time they just blow you away. And it's a lot of them, What's really cool is a lot of them um, work full time in music, but then many of them are serving and this what doing whatever you need to do on the side to make your dream come true, which so many of us have done. Mm-hmm. So it's so funny because your server at every given moment can just be like wicked talented. And it's I hear what you're saying, where it's almost like there's so many of them that how do you stand out? And I think so much of that is networking who, you know, luck. If you're doing a gig and there's the right person there that reaches out to you, but yeah, it's, it's so crazy because you'll be there, especially when you go outside of Broadway to all these different places. Like I was talking about, everyone is so unbelievably talented that you just want to shake the world and say, (laughs) all of these people need to make it. But I understand that it would be kind of frustrating because you, you probably need to find ways to stand out because it is so saturated with talent that man, I just, I feel for the people that are there that haven't made it, but I think it's just one of those situations where if you're passionate about it and if you have the talent there, eventually it will, your time will come, but it's just, it comes down to things like luck, working or working your butt off. It's, yeah. And I, and I think it goes without saying too, and this is to all the listeners and viewers of the podcast, that when live music does return, you know, yes, go see your favorite bands when they, you know, when they hit your arenas, mm-hmm. hit your stadiums. Go to the small venues. Yes. There are so many small venues that are hurting right now. And Mm -hmm. just, you know, their regular audience, you know, or but they've built their entire, you know, like, you know, existence on live music. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't happened for like a year. So, you know, support your your faves, 
but go go to those smaller clubs see those totally. see those acts you know before they 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 blow up or to be able to say you miss the most magical moment you know mm-hmm. because live music has always been where it's at are you still in touch with anyone down there and how have they been handling all of this yeah katie offerman she's still one of my best friends in this whole world so she she's in a so i'll actually i'll give you a bit of her backstory because it is just the story of someone making it. When I moved down there, it was the summer of 2017, right after I graduated school. And this is such a funny thing for me. I love talking about the story because my the first day I landed there, she picks me up and she goes, okay, um, do you want to come watch me? I'm doing a gig at this, at this fair. And I went, absolutely, I do. So we pack up, we go down to Franklin, Tennessee, and it's not a county fair. It's not, not a super big one. There's... It was the most stereotypical Tennessee experience I could ever imagine. I'm in the back of like, I'm sitting on hay bales and there's an open bar, which I naturally <laughs> loved and really involved myself in. At like the, two mo- the two most <laughs> magical words of the English language were put together, open bar. Right. And then there are horses and then there are different wagons that you can just sit in and drink and be pulled around. And I'll never, ever forget <laughs> who opened up for Katie because she performed at it and there was a group of probably 10 people. And I can only talk about this now because she's totally made it. But her opening act was a Q&A about snakes. <laughs> that is so spinal tap. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, it was a Q&A that people were deeply involved in that went on for about 20 minutes. And I'm sitting there going, there's no way this is real. Like the Ashton Kutcher's got to jump out right now going, okay, this is a joke. Tennessee isn't actually like this. There were people lined up to ask questions about snakes because it's a fair and that's what those people cared about. And then next up comes Katie and her bed. <laughs> so to go from that, and it's just, she's just worked her ass off and performed all of these gigs and just never saying no, never saying no to any opportunity. And then the right person sees you and then you connect and, and it's all about that. But that was a pretty funny story that I liked <laughs> because it was my first experience watching her play. And then even in the short time that I lived with her in Nashville, the gigs started to get bigger and whichever, but yeah, the Q and A about snakes is absolutely one of my favorites. <laughs> So you mentioned earlier in the show about Galvanize. For those who don't know what it is, explain to us what Galvanize does. So Galvanize is run by Laura Oakman, who is just an absolute goddess in this industry. So her mantra is empowered women, empower women. So it's partially to create this amazing community of women. And then there's this other part of it that we work with NFL athletes. Typically it's branched out a bit since then. So we're their first media experience. So some of them went to the big schools and they played for, they were the star wide out for UCLA and they've dealt with media, but some of the players are walking in really nervous and they're not quite sure what to expect. And they're not quite sure how to deal with the media, especially right now in today's landscape, there's kind of a stigma where people don't necessarily want to open up or whichever. So what she, the whole premise that she goes with is focusing on your who, not your do. So we'll sit down with these rookies and they typically it's in person. They've been over Zoom for this last year, but typically it's in person and they walk into the room and they're wide eyed because they don't know what's going on. And we have usually it's about 20 of us female reporters that have come from Canada, the States from all over to work with this team. So we go in, usually we'll have one or two athletes that we work with. We've done all of our research on them. Everything you can Google, we've found out about them, every interview we've seen, whichever. So they have no idea what they're walking into. And then she gives this beautiful speech, basically just explaining like, this is your opportunity to create your own narrative, to write your own story, because people in the media will say whatever they want about you. If you, if you work with us, it's an opportunity for you to tell your own story and give a bit of your who behind what you do, like who you are as a person, what got you there. So it's funny because we'll go in, we won't talk about football. We won't talk about stats. We won't talk about anything except who the person is that got them there. And it's so cool because she, she commands the room first and she just explains like who here is a running back and who has been told that maybe you have a two, three season shelf life. I don't think so. And just kind of about creating your own narrative or whichever. And she explains like she's a woman on air in her forties. And she said that she's grown up being told her entire life that, yep, you can be on air until you can't. 
that there's a shelf life for you too. And then she's looking at that going, I don't think so. I'm talented. Why don't I deserve to be here? Why does it have to be a looks thing or whichever? So she basically explains that if you want to have your own foundation, if you want to have your own clothing line, if you want to have your own charity, any of these things, start creating your own narrative. And this is your chance to do this. You're about to enter the NFL, or maybe you won't because not everybody makes the team. But this is your opportunity to have this interview where you can open up and you can show it to people and say, this is who I am. This is what's coming from my heart, from my soul. So the first one I did was with the LA Chargers and I had um, a safety named Adarius Pickett. And when I, I first met him, he was really nervous and he was pretty quiet. And then we go off and we sit down for an hour. And the first thing I do is go, hey, my name's Katie. This is my story. This is the hardest thing I've ever been through. No small talk. The, and how she leads us to that moment is so there's a two day course. So the second day is when we're working with the athlete. The first day we walk into the room and it's her and it's all of the other female reporters and you write your name on a name tag. And then instead of writing where you're from or what you do, you write your biggest fear in this whole world. So right away, I'm like, oh, here we go. So I wrote down um, fear of letting people down, whether it's my family, my teachers, my rookie, myself. And the first thing we do is we approach a woman and she sets a timer and you go, hi, my name's Katie. This is my biggest fear. And you're leading the conversation with vulnerability. There's no, no small talk. There's no opportunity to look at people and size up yourself against them over things that virtually don't matter. And then all of a sudden, instead of looking at these women going, oh, they're all so beautiful. They're so successful. What am I doing here? I, and then the imposter syndrome kicks in. She preemptively doesn't allow that to happen where right away you're looking at these women that you might otherwise be intimidated by. And the first thing they're saying to you is their biggest fear. So you're instantly connecting on a level going, I feel that too. I get that too. So that's the first day. It's 16 hours in a boardroom of like going through all of these basically like vulnerability exercises. So when we walk into the camp the next day, when we're working with the athletes, all of us have bonded so closely together that we know we have each other and we're cheering each other on. And then it just creates this safe space. So one of her taglines is girls compete women in power. And that's truly, truly what you feel. So when you go and you deal with the athletes, I went and sat down with Adarius and I explained my story and then I asked him really, really tough questions. And she sets it up in a way where you almost feel stupid if you're not being vulnerable. Because what happens after that, we go into the room and there's the big setup of the lights, the camera. There, you do a sit down interview in front of your peers. So we're doing it in front of the reporters and the rookies and they're doing it in front of their peers. And it creates this space that bonds the rookies together in a way that we weren't planning on doing it uh, through quarantine. And then the Falcons actually reached out and said, we need this. We need this because it creates this brotherhood between all of these men where all of a sudden they're sitting there and people are in tears and people get up and hug each other and they learn things about people that they're about to spend time with. And it bonds them as a team in ways that we just can't even imagine before I saw it with my own eyes. Like, like I said, people were in tears and then just people learning like, oh, you lost your dad. I lost my dad too. And learning about not going in there and trying to be like the alpha male, you're learning who people's souls are. And it's just, it's such a cool experience. And they were able to post the videos and, and you learn about the players because so much of what I'm learning as I go through this industry is yes, I love talking about defenses in the NFL and I love talking about stats and hockey and this and this and this. I care so much more about who the person is. Mm -hmm. When I'm watching the Super Bowl, I love the features of someone who has lost their mom and they're playing for their mom and the human side of it because it, it makes these people so much more relatable. When it, Yes, they're on this pedestal, but when someone's talking about like Last night on Sportsnet, they aired this really beautiful piece about Tyler Mott talking about his struggle with depression and anxiety. I'm someone that struggles with that. So I'm sitting there watching that going, okay, all of a sudden you're not just a hockey player. You're someone I relate to. So the program that she does is so, so important, A, in creating this, the sisterhood is what we call it because it truly, truly is. But then the way that that's able to impact these NFL players, and it's so cool because you see them go out and kill it on the field and you're like, oh, that's my buddy. It's like, you feel like a proud mom when you go out and watch them kill it. But just 
the space that she creates, it just focuses so much on strength and vulnerability and the power of it just can't be understated. And I was about to say, like, Obviously in sports, it's a, it's a very competitive environment, but in mm-hmm. broadcasting, it can be competitive as well because yep. everyone wants to get that, that, that pristine job. You know, everyone mm-hmm. wants to be the Laura Oakman. Everyone wants to be mm-hmm. the Rachel Nichols, but you know, for, to hear you say it, it's basically, it becomes more of a family. How important is an organization's, you know, pretty much understated or actually outright stated goal is to create a family in the broadcast industry? It really should be the most important thing. And like you said, it can, it can be so competitive. And I feel like even in school with the women there, it felt like there was a bit of a compete level because there wasn't as many of us women or whichever. And it something that I've realized, like galvanized changed my whole life because I think I always did feel threatened by other women. And when it was, it was, and I realize now that it was stemming from bad places, whether it's my own self doubt or insecurities or whichever, What I've realized now is because she's created this family, so many more opportunities have been created because of it, because we have all these group chats with these women and we hype each other up so much that if there's an opportunity somebody sees that might be good for me, they'll send it to me and just things like that. Like the opportunities it's actually created because so many people think, okay, there are so many people and there are so many jobs. So of course you're going to have to compete for them without realizing that when people have your back, that's when the opportunities open up so, so, so much more. So I think organizations really, really should be focusing on that first. Like, and that goes back to Nashville too. I'll never forget when I think it was the day they clinched the president's trophy and Sean, the president and CEO, he sent out an email and just said, dear all Smashville, we are meeting out on the terrace at 3.30, non-optional. If you have work to do, sorry, it can wait. I'm the highest. Of the, he didn't say that, but it's like, he's the boss. He's going to say, yep, you have to listen to me. So we all went out onto the, the patio there and he was holding the microphone and then he gave this big grand speech or whatever. And then he goes, everybody put your drink up. And then he goes, chug your drink. And, and it was just, and then everybody's getting drunk. We're playing cornhole openly out on the plaza outside of Bridgestone Arena. And it was a moment of, we were a family and that is just the most special thing in the entire world because it's a moment I'll never forget that, that president's trophy, which is so funny because that aligns with them hanging those ridiculous banners, (laughs) but with the hanging all those ridiculous banners, that's, that's a memory of me being with my big extended family. Like I know that it's hard with, with corporations and whichever, and obviously that's a bigger conversation, but if you're able to create that family and show people that you're valued. Like the amount of times, especially in this industry that people don't give you an attaboy, if you actually go out of your way to encourage people and make them feel like a family, that's why it's so special with what Laura's done. I really, really think organizations, big or small, should really, really focus on that first. Because Wes, like we're realizing right now how human all of us are in this pandemic, the Mm -hmm. importance of things like self-care and whichever that we weren't necessarily focusing on as much before. We were focusing on things like hustle culture. And if you're not busy, you're not doing it right. You're not working hard enough. Like if you can create a space where you're, you're showing that you're valued, it's so, so, so important. For someone trying to get into broadcasting or storytelling or content creation Mm -hmm. or whatever the case and suffers from self-doubt, suffers mm-hmm. from imposter syndrome, and suffers from like just something eating inside that's, that, that tells them I'm not good enough. From all that you've experienced so far, what would you tell someone in that boat? Oh, that's such a good question. And it's interesting because when I went to school and I was 26, I was later when I went to school, I was still in that boat. I was in that boat of... I needed validation from others because I hadn't yet found it within myself. And I'll never forget Jim Van Horn saying this, where he was talking about confidence and he was explaining that after every um, update that we would do on the desk, he can't sit there and then just say, Oh, you're great. And this and this, and this and all these good things. He said, because if our confidence is coming from someone else, that person has the power to take it away. Whereas if you eventually get to a place where you can find it on your own, no one can take that from you. And yes, not everybody's going to agree with it or see your shine or whichever. But it's interesting because for me, 
And everybody's story is different. For me, it basically took hitting absolute rock bottom to start and it, it, to give me the opportunity to build myself up into who I wanted to be. When I was in school, I had no self-confidence. I was a completely different person that I almost don't even recognize, which is hard because it, sports broadcasting school is a really vulnerable setting where you're standing up and you're speaking into a microphone when you're not necessarily comfortable. For me, it was, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but um, I was diagnosed with cancer while I was in school. And it was the next year after, after I moved home from Nashville that I completely hit rock bottom. And that was when I started to find my self-worth. And I think it was, it had been taken away. It had been taken away to a point where I completely bottomed out and it was like, okay, you can either stay down here forever or you can find that love for yourself. And it's, it's tough to say because everybody finds it in a different way, but that's what it goes back to for me is just, it truly, truly does have to come from you because so many times our validation or confidence does come from other people. Our worth comes from other people. But when it truly stems from you, that, that's why what Jim said, it just resonates with me so hard. It's everybody needs to go through it and you find it in your own way, but just as long as you eventually get there. And so much of that for me has been the people I surround myself with, people that inspire me, people that lift me up rather than just sit around and talk about other people. We talk about ideas. We talk about inspiring things. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I don't think there's necessarily a right answer, but I just think as long as we're all having this conversation. Now you mentioned, of course, um, being diagnosed with cancer. Um, how was that? Like when you, you're in the process of trying to get into that dream career and all of a sudden like this, this albatross mm -hmm. falls on your shoulders. How, how was that? Like, like, how did you get through that? Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it was so, it was so, so hard, but I didn't realize how hard it was in the moment because th this is what I tell people is everybody's advice when, when you go through something so traumatic and so life altering and changing, people don't know what to say. And I don't expect them to, but everybody's advice was just take it one day at a time. And I think I took that advice almost to a fault that I'm able to look back on it now and self-reflect, but every single thing I did was just take it one day at a time. So I put my head down. I was still in school. I was, I had just started interning at the NHL network at Sirius XM the day before I found out I was sick. So I was total hustle culture. I was right into it. So I put my head down. I just go, okay, adding the hospital trips is something I'm just adding to my schedule. And it was one day at a time. And I'll never forget when they, they diagnosed me and then they left me in a room alone for 20 minutes after telling me I had cancer when I had like a thousand questions. So of course I just completely spiraled out in that moment. But then that same day they gave me a package of this schedule of 17 different appointments of scans of like a CT, MRI, colonoscopy, this, 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 this. And I remember just like, Oh my God. Like you couldn't have waited till the next day for it to sink in a bit, but it was an intense situation. They put me on the schedule and every, I would just put my head down and okay, today is the chest CT. And then that's all I need to think about. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to go through this, but I don't think it was the right way for me because everything was just so one day at a time that I didn't grasp the magnitude of how intense this was. And I also think I was a bit numb because so much of my focus was, okay, I'm away from my family. I am in Toronto there in British Columbia. I was so hyper worried about my family and I was worried about everyone else because I kept saying, um, I'm fine, which I'm fine. I'm fine. Which now to me, I realize is the F word. I wasn't fine, <laughs> but it was just, I was so numb and I put my head down and it was just, okay, one day at a time. And then basically right after it all happened, I had another crazy intense surgery. And then I healed from my surgery and I moved to Nashville. So I moved to Nashville when I was still bandaged for my surgery. And I didn't want to tell people because I didn't want to be the cancer girl. I don't ever want it to be something that defines me. It's okay that it's a part of me. It's a big part of what's made me, me and who I am and whichever. And I'm really, really proud of that. But I, it's something that in that, it, cause it was that same year that I was diagnosed and then cancer free and then moved to Nashville all in the same year. So I didn't want to be defined by that. And I don't necessarily regret that, 
But that was almost a period of being able to continue to just numb of I'm living this exciting life and whichever. And it's like all of this trauma is kind of under the surface. And I keep just pushing it down by living this extravagant and cool, interesting life. So I moved home from Nashville and actually I'll be completely honest about this. A big part of what made me totally hit rock bottom was a breakup I experienced. It was someone that was my, my forever. And I I now understand why it needed to happen because it needed to push me to rock bottom to where I feel and experience all of these things from being sick. But basically we were together and love of my life, all that BS. He, I had a second cancer scare come up and it was obviously really traumatic because I was still dealing with intense PTSD that I didn't even realize I had. And it was just like, no way I have to do this again. There's no way I'm not strong enough. I can't handle this. And he bailed. He left me because it was too hard. He straight up said like woman of my dreams kind of vibe, but I don't know how to be there for you. And that to me was this life altering moment of, okay, I'm unlovable. I can be good as a person. I can check all the boxes for people, but what I've been through is too intense for people that no one will ever be able to handle it. And that's what, and so then there comes the self-worth, the ability to be loved, all of these things that no one should ever be, have the power to take away from you. All of a sudden I was feeling all of them at absolute bottom. And that was, like I said earlier, where that gave me the opportunity to build myself up into who I wanted, but that was one of the hardest things where yes, I was grieving the breakup, but then it was also like, you're the cancer girl and you're going to be the one that goes to scans for the, like I have seven years left of being scanned every six months and it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's hard to go to the scan. It's hard to wait for the results and it's hard to be there for someone because you don't know what to say. There's nothing you can say to make it better. So you just need to show up. But I think people feel that pressure that you need to say the right thing to be there. So it was just this total identity crisis of I'll never have the ability to be loved again. So that was one of the harder parts of it. But as I said earlier, I would never change any of it because now I've built up to, okay, all of this needed to happen. And I now have to attach something positive to getting sick. Like I've started public speaking a bit, even though I'm terrified of microphones and I've started sharing my story about getting sick and about mental illness or whichever, because If I'm going to have any sort of platform and if I'm going to have had to go through that, I need to connect them and I need to create something positive out of getting sick. Cause it doesn't, when you get sick at 28, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't, it's traumatic. It's hard. It doesn't make any sense. So now that I'm a bit further away from it, I have to, for myself, attach something positive to it where now I can go, okay, that happened to me because I was strong enough to get through it. And now I owe it to the rest of the world to give something back, to tell my story, to be having conversations like this, to show like you can get through something so intense. This is, these are the things that help me, whichever. So now that I can attach something positive to it, I'm able to kind of grasp it a bit more. Cause that was a lot of the confusion is just, this doesn't make sense, but now I can look at it and go, okay, this is who I was supposed to be, which is kind of cool. It's so cool to be far enough away from it. Not to say I still don't struggle with PTSD, with mental illness, all of that. But yeah, it was, it was hard, but now I'm finally able to see the good that's come out of it. First of all, I'm so happy that you've, you know, gotten through all of that. So we could have this conversation today. You've been very, you've been very open about, you know, going through cancer and all of the struggles and all that. Uh, Do you find that being open and telling your story has been able to help other people along the way? Mm -hmm. Otherwise I would never do it. (laughs) (laughs) I, I was so closed off to a point that when I was diagnosed with anxiety, I think it was in like 2016, like it wasn't that long ago. I didn't even tell my family. And then when, cause I was just, there was this stigma that I had that I think I was either embarrassed or ashamed or whichever. And then when I got sick, I didn't want the focus to be on me. I didn't want to tell people. I tried to hide it. I, I didn't want to tell people at school. I, I just, I was so, I just, I don't want to make it about me or whichever. And then now that when I do talk about it, I see the response because even if it's not cancer, people have parallels with that life shattering moment where you do bottom out. And I think just 
being able to speak to that and then say like, I am a new person because of it. And just all of these things, like it gives me as much as I hope that it gives other people. Like it's given me so much strength and so much confidence to know that I can give back a bit. Like with, with the pandemic too, Wis, this is a big thing is a lot of people in my very close inner circle are in healthcare. So the pandemic hits and it was one of those moments of seeing in real time who in our society is essential and who is not. And it was that big moment of, okay, for all of the days I've been really, really stressed out and I've been burnt out and this, and this, and this, all of a sudden a pandemic hits and I'm unemployed and I'm thinking, what have I given back? Whereas I have these important people in my life that are on the front lines and saving lives and they're all the stress they've been through to get them to that moment feels so worth it where I'm sitting there going, what am I doing? And it was one of those moments where I just thought, okay, this is where you pivot where yes, I would always, always like to stay in sports, but one of the reasons I want to have some sort of a platform is so I can find a way to give back. Like last year was the first time that I spoke. I spoke at a, it was a digital conference, but it was supposed to be in person in Chicago um, from, it was called empowering girls for life. And they reached out and to go down there and to tell my story. And, and that was the moment where I said to myself, yes, this is terrifying. This is all so scary for me, but it's something I can give back because I think a few of us have had that inner chat with ourselves of, who's essential and who's not. And I'm probably not alone in feeling like I've been burnt out by work. I've been so stressed. And then all of a sudden this hits where, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Do you think like, have, have you felt anything like that through the pandemic of just. It's, it, it does get tough. I mean, you know, me, I, uh, I like to keep busy. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I very much, you know, subscribe to the workaholic is life kind yes. of mentality. You know, if I don't have, you know, seven projects on the go, I probably have 13. Um, mm-hmm. But when everything stops and I, and I remember this too, like, you know, being told to, to like, go work from home. And I, I'm very fortunate. You know, I, I wholeheartedly recognize that I'm very fortunate to be still be able to work from home with my regular day job. But a lot of the other things that I was doing, that you mentioned I'm in a band and all that, all that stopped. All that mm-hmm. stopped. And then all of a sudden you have to shift. You, know, you yeah. have to you have to shift. And then of course the 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 pandemic, you know, you're about a month in, you realize, okay, well, we're gonna be here for a while. I'm mm-hmm. gonna do this, 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 this. And you have all these great grandiose ideas. Yeah. And then you you start to work on it and you realize that uh, what the heck am I doing? Yeah. And, and exactly. As, and as it goes on. You know, you all of a sudden realize that you miss a lot of different things. Like mm-hmm. you, you miss everything from, you know, like, like for yourself, you know, the, 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 the rush of the live stage of Puck Talks Live, uh, for myself, the rush of being in a band and playing on stage mm-hmm. live, to even the smallest things. Like I miss, you know, getting my Yangju beef from the Manchu walk from a very specific, yes. you know, like, and you all of a sudden realize that, I don't even know if that place is going to still be there. I don't mm-hmm. even know if some of these bars that we used to play are still going to be there. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's been, you know, almost a year since Rudy Gobert started tapping microphones and we all got sent home where it's insane. <laughs> it is. It's insane. And, and you sit there and realize that I don't know when normal's going to be. I don't mm-hmm. know when I'm going to be, you know, going back out to clubs and playing. I don't know when I'm going to be going to the office on a regular basis. I don't even know if I do want to start going back to the, you know, Mm -hmm. the thought of getting on a train and going from like, you know, (laughs) exactly. Can can you imagine? There's going to be a lot of people Mm -hmm. that have that, you know, not not necessarily PTSD, but almost like PPSD, post-pandemic stress disorder. And, aren't mm-hmm. going to be able to go down into the subway station to, to go to work because it's going to be too peopley. Um, and it all of a sudden it, it, it makes you question like, yep. I mean, again, I'm fortunate. I'm able to do what I do from home and, you know, not really kind of miss a beat. Uh, and my, my wife has been very fortunate. She's kind of the same way as well. Uh, so we're very lucky, but you know, I also worry about, you know, I've got kids. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I worry about, you know, 
this is this is you know going to affect them and like you know they're miss they miss their friends they're they're they're, they're back to school but they, they, they did miss their friends when they had to mm-hmm. you know stay at home and whatnot like it, there's just so many questions and zero answers and yeah. as much as you know you hear you know you know therapists and doctors on the radio or on tv talking about all this they don't have the answers either you know, because mm-hmm. they weren't practicing 100 years ago when we all went through the Spanish flu. So mm-hmm. it, it it does. It, it You know, you, you have those nights where, you know, you worry about the littlest thing. You mm-hmm. worry about the absolute littlest thing and you wake up at two o'clock in the morning, then the mind starts racing and you can't get back to sleep. So, yeah, they're, they're, you know, you get the sleep deprivation, you get, you know, all of this stuff happening and it can be tough, you know, because we don't have those outlets anymore. Yeah. Well, I feel like a lot of our identity has been wrapped up in things that have all been taken away. Mm-hmm. Like my identity has always been very much in work. And I'm, it's, it was nice to step back and kind of reevaluate that of, okay, what are my priorities coming out back into the new normal world that we're going to have? Because so much of my identity has always been work. So that's been a kind of nice realization. But the big thing is that all of us have, no matter what, no matter who you are in this world, we're not in control right now. No. We're not in control of almost anything in our lives. And it's different with different groups of people and where you live and whichever, but all of us have this common theme right now where we're not in control. And as someone with OCD, that is a really big trigger for me because control is kind of my safe space. So I think a lot of people have been struggling with that because yeah, you can't just go do a show and make everything better and get your head out of whatever space it's in Mm -hmm. or whichever it's, it's such a wild thing that has banded our entire globe together in a way we didn't ever expect. There's no one in the entire world whose life isn't a bit changed through this. Mm-hmm. And it's and- almost something that's weirdly unifying where it's not just in your nation or this or that or your community. It's every single person in the world has had some amount of control taken away from them. Mm-hmm. And like, especially too, when, you know, when you're trying to, when you're in the broadcast industry, when you are, you know, a professional storyteller, mm-hmm. right. Uh, and all of a sudden, like you've worked so hard to get to this point and then some of it is pulled back. You know, it's, it's one of those reminders that we're not what we do. We are yes, us. Exactly. And what we do is just what we do, but we are not what we do. And I think mm-hmm. that that's, that's probably hit a lot of people really hard. You know, they sit there and say, you know, they don't introduce you, you know, themselves as I'm so-and-so, you know, I, they just say, hi, I do this. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm an editor. I'm a singer. I'm a, I'm a construction worker. Not, it's not what you are. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to get through that. I, I, I wonder, what would you, you know, knowing all that you know now, Right what would you tell young Katie about now? And what would young Katie tell today's Katie about how to, you know, not be so hurt by everything that's going on? Oh, that's such a good question. Because we are, we're idealistic when we're young. But what would young Katie tell today, Katie? That's so interesting because young Katie I was so, you'll never believe this because you know me. <laughs> when I was young, I was unbelievably shy and quiet to a point that my grandmother would say hi to me and I wouldn't even say hi back because I was that shy. And my mom's kind of looking at me going, that's your grandma, get real. <laughs> so I was so, so shy and so quiet that to see this life that I've curated for myself now and to see this level of confidence and self-awareness I have and to be able to speak on a microphone, it, I, I think I would be really, really proud of it. But to go back and speak to young Katie, I would just want to give her a hug and say, it's going to be okay. And you're going to go through a bunch of hard things. And there are going to be a bunch of people that are going to tell you, you can't do it. So many people, but you can. And things are going to get really, really bad, but things are also going to get really, really beautiful. And you're going to find a relationship with yourself that you didn't know you were going to be capable of finding. That's and have you seen, okay, have you seen the show RuPaul's Drag Race? It's one of I my have, absolute favorites. I, I have not. I'm, I'm still in the middle of WandaVision, so. <laughs> oh, okay. RuPaul is like my heart and soul. But they ask these drag queens on there, they show them a photo of them as a young child and they say, what would you say to yourself? And that's always my favorite part of the series because oftentimes th- these people have had really intense experiences and 
And that, and it's just, it all goes back to the who, the who you are, the, who's your soul, what got you there? And I just love that question so much of what would you ask or what would you say to yourself as a child? Because so many of us have similar answers of it's going to be really hard, but you will be okay. And I think that's something really powerful. In some of our darkest moments, some people tend to lean on music. Mm-hmm. as as a as a crutch as a way to get through some of the tough times are, are you one of those people that you know you have your go-tos uh, mm-hmm. whether it be mood or artists or songs or whatever to get you through uh, the hardest moments of your life music is it's like many people it's a very emotional experience for me and what's cool because when i was talking about when i was young and i was so shy and so quiet i started dancing when i was three years old so Music for me was a way that I could connect and show up because I was a really good tap dancer as a kid. And I was able to go out onto a stage being so quiet that I couldn't even speak to people, but I would go out on a stage alone and then the music would hit and I'd have the spotlight on me. And I was able to connect with it so much that I could put on the performance of a seven-year-old lifetime. (laughs) (laughs) It was so cool because that's the one thing that the stage was a safe space for me, which seems really contradictory because it isn't such a spotlight, but it was, it was music for me. It was, it was always the safe space that I could kind of put my head down and go, okay, I can connect with every single beat and I can, and I love choreography and I love putting on a performance. And all of that is just because I feel music so, so deeply. And I had a cool moment, actually. There's a, I have a cancer song. It's, it's something that I didn't realize I needed to get me through that whole battle. Cause like I said, most of it, I went through by myself. I went to all my appointments alone because my family was all in BC and I was on the, the, uh, the, Oh my God, what the trolley, what the streetcar there. Mm -hmm. Oh God, the streetcar (laughs) in Toronto on my way to Toronto Western was where most of my appointments were. And I had this, this new playlist of songs that I had been into and it probably had 40 songs on it or whichever. And I had hit shuffle and I put my headphones and I head to the hospital. It was, I remember hearing the song, it's called Crowded Places by Banks. It's really, really beautiful. I was pulling up, walking up to the hospital one day and it came on and I just thought, oh, what a nice comforting song right now. And then shut it off, go to my appointment. Next day, back to the hospital, listening to my playlist, I'm walking in and then the song comes on again at the exact same time on the streetcar. And I went, okay. And it's on shuffle and it's, it's a small enough playlist but it's a big enough playlist where it was weird. So it almost became like, oh, cool. That happened twice in a row. The third time I'm like, okay, okay, universe, I get it. (laughs) It comes on again. And then it became a song that I would start putting on before I would enter the hospital. And eventually I became comfortable enough with it because I would get really anxious with the crowds and And the whole premise of it is feeling alone in a crowded place. And that's how I felt at the hospital. Like I listen to the lyrics now and it's wild how much the universe was being like, hey, idiot, you need to listen to this right now because you're about to have some pretty intense PTSD. And it got to a point that before, like before my big surgery, my mom and I, she flew out for it. We were sitting in the chair. I'm in the gown ready to go in and we would put my headphones in and listen to it. And it became this song that would soothe me and comfort me because it was... And it's, it's emotional now if I hear that song, because the, the first few hymns off the top, if I start to hear it, good night, Irene, I am <laughs> bawling my eyes. <laughs> but it's so cool because it, it, it was this coincidence that kept happening that eventually I went, okay, I don't think this is a coincidence. I think this is a song and a place that I can go to where it's just me and I know that I'll be okay. And the lyrics are something that in that moment where I'm feeling really in a crowded hospital, feeling really scared and isolated, which I'm sure a lot of those people were also feeling, it resonated with me so much, but it became such a safe space. And I feel like a lot of us have that. And in the pandemic, I've noticed that I go back to certain TV shows because they make me feel like home. They make me feel normalcy. And I do that a lot with music as well. And that's the one song that I'm always able to go back to because it's my, it's my cancer song. It's my safe space. How has your music taste evolved from young dancer, Katie <laughs> to, you know, kick-ass storyteller who's great on a mic, Katie. Oh, so, wow. It started out with all the classics of the NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Spice Girls. Love that. 
And then like many children in high school, I had my very distinct and way too long emo phase that I do not regret, but I was still like the little shy one that's like rocking out so hard to against me and rise against <laughs> to Lex on fire. <laughs> All of these funny bands where it's like little old me walking through the hallways in school, just like blasting shit being, Oh, just so, so good. But <laughs> now, now I'm able to look at it and like, I, nobody has iPods anymore, but if you were to look at my iPod, there is nineties hip hop and then there's boy bands and there's new music and there's country and there's this and this and this. And you look at it and you're kind of like, who is this person that owns this iPod? <laughs> but so much of it is when I'm feeling a certain way, you tap into that. You want to amplify those emotions, whether you're sad, oftentimes you kind of want to lean into that and cry your face out. Or if you're feeling happy, you put on happy music and you, you amplify that feeling. So I like having a total variety of music in my playlist because I'm able to kind of cater it to how I'm feeling or how I want to feel. When we're young, you know, it's, it's very common that we all were given, you know, albums or CDs or whatever the case um, for like birthday gifts or Christmas mm-hmm. gifts, but to actually take your own hard earned money, whether it be allowance, part-time job, whatever it was, mm-hmm. and to go to the record store and buy that first album. You know, the, obviously that album means like, do you remember the first album you went and bought with your own money? No, no, baby. Tragic Kingdom. <laughs> Straight, yeah. straight, straight up. <laughs> straight up. I, cause I was just so excited about it. I had received albums on cassettes because that's my age demographic. So I had received albums. And in your last podcast, you were speaking about listening to music and then recording it onto a tape. I totally did all of that too. <laughs> so like Backstreet Boys, Spice Girls, Savage Garden was one of my first albums. But the first one that I bought myself was No Doubt. And I'll never forget it. Still a banger. <laughs> Still oh, still, it's still a good one. Um, but what what was it about that album? Like, was it the, the whole album that you bought it for or just specific songs? I think I originally bought it for some specific songs. Like, Don't Speak was always such a classic. Mm-hmm. But then when I listened to it, it was, oh, okay. So every single one of these songs is good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it is. It's one of those like front to back every song, like totally. you know, all, all killer, no filler. And it was just like, it was all of the rage. So of course, as a young kid, when everybody else is buying it, you want to be part of the crowd. That's what all the cool kids were listening to. And I wasn't a cool kid, but I listened to music like one. (laughs) Okay. We have come to the point in the podcast, Katie, where it's time to get personal here. Let's go. Okay. (laughs) Because we haven't been yet. We haven't been personal at all. (laughs) We've just been scratching the surface here. It's all been nice at this point. (laughs) So, okay. So here's the, here's the situation. Mm -hmm. You're introducing yourself to someone you've never met before, total stranger, but rather than tell them who you are, you hand them a mixtape full of songs that tell the story of you. What is on that mixtape and why are those songs there? Oh, I love this question so much because it does. It says so much about a person. The first song that I would have on there, it's called This Too Shall Last by Anderson East. I'm a big Anderson East guy. He is so fantastic. Um, His album Encore is one of the most perfect albums front to back that I've ever heard. He's a big, big Tennessee sound. (laughs) But that song, it's about, it's just about a lasting relationship that you can always go back to. And it's actually a song that I've discovered in quarantine about myself and my relationship with myself, which is cool. Because like I said, I lived in a world of self-doubt and insecurity and I never thought I'd get here. But I'm able to listen to it and it, it resonates with me in a way of like the pandemic for so many of us are, okay, sink or swim. You're on your own. You're isolated. You have no choice but to just deal with it. And it's been really, really powerful to see how many challenging situations I've been put in and I can hang. And I, at the end of the day, I can go back and like have a glass of wine and hang out with me and go like, hell yeah, we did that. <laughs> so that one is a big, big favorite of mine is that song by Anderson East. Um... I would want to represent the different music phases of my life. So I would probably have Ready to Fall by Rise Against. That was just, I've always been a huge Rise fan. (laughs) Like even as I grew out of that phase, their songs will come on and I'm like, oh, okay, it's time to party now. (laughs) Um, An important one to me would be Moondance by Van Morrison. 
Okay. So my parents are gigantic Van Morrison fans. So growing up, whenever they would have like a nice date or it would be our family hanging out or whichever, whenever it was a celebratory moment and we were hanging, they would put on Van Morrison. So it was always synonymous with like just cool, fun nights with the family. And it's just Van Morrison is just beautiful. (laughs) All of his music is unbelievable. Okay. Where do we want to go next? Um, I would have Crowded Places by Banks on there, my cancer song. I would also have, because that was that was my song for when I was going through it. And then I've had a few crazy moments with the song I'm Still Standing by Elton John since then, where it comes on at the right time or whichever. And then that's kind of become my celebratory, I beat this song. So that would be on there. And Elton John is just... Oh, that, that, song, John. That, that song is a straight banger. Let's be honest. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and it was cool because I started with Sportsnet right before the bubble playoffs last year and I'm still standing became their goal song. So okay. it was really, really special when, when they would win and I grew up a huge Canucks fan. So it was one of those full circle moments of, holy crap, I'm being paid to talk about my favorite hockey team right now. And when they win a game, that song plays. And the first time it, it, because it was new as of that season, I Mm -hmm. bawled my eyes out. (laughs) (laughs) But it was one of those cool moments of like connecting with something so deeply through music that it's it's a good happy cry, which is just so, so important. Um, Oh, Wes, you'll know this one because we talked about this in school, No Leaf Clover by Metallica. Yes, yes. Huge Metallica guy. SM is one of my favorite albums ever. And I, for my Super Bowl pack, I chose that as my song because it was just, and I still to this day, I have PTSD about that because um, <laughs> I wanted to, to use that song, but then only do like half of a quarter of the game because there's so much you could do with it. I, and I remember there was this huge sack by Von Miller and I'm like, I really need that to go with this part of the song. And <laughs> And it didn't work, but yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite songs. There's just a, there's an intensity to it that is just unmatched. There's mm-hmm. something really special about the intensity of that song that really resonates with me. And so that add, one. And just adding the full orchestra to Metallica is so good. God, what a treat that we as a society were gifted that album. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. So Metallica would definitely be on there. They were, they've been a consistent for me, probably starting at like, Grade eight, I was big into them. Okay. Um, this one will surprise people, but it is my go-to karaoke song. And I'm really good at it. <laughs> it is Clint Eastwood by the Gorillas. You do realize you now have to sing some of that. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's more so <laughs> rapping. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm not rapping on this podcast today. Um, but that is one that... Like, you know what song that is, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so my, I, I like flexing on people with that one because I know every single word so, so well. So I won't need to look at the karaoke screen. And because I'm a performer, I like to just make a huge show of everything. So I'll like grab the mic. And if it's a wireless mic, I'll just walk through the crowd kind of rapping. And there's always people that are like, pardon me. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> what but is really happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Clint Eastwood still bangs. That is such a banger. Um, what else do we want to go? I think I would have, I would have some strong independent women because that's a really big priority in my life. So I would have some Queen B, probably Love on Top, and I'd go Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? Such a good song. Oh, God, it's so good. I've been listening to it so much lately, like almost daily. She's just. Tina slaps so hard. Yeah, those are two important ones. Um, What are some other ones? Where do we go here? Oh, here's one. This is what the album would end on. Have you heard? God, I'm going to have to explain this one. Have you heard the song Stroking by Clarence Carter? I have. (laughs) So that cracks my list. (laughs) So a dear friend of mine, her name is Kate. We have a, um, they go to our family cabin out at Kootenai Lake together. She is one of the funniest people I've ever met. She introduced me to this song. If you haven't heard it, it's one of the weirdest, most hypersexual, but, oh, I don't even know how to explain it. It slaps. It's a banger. (laughs) So 
she showed this song to us and we're all sitting there going like, how have we never heard this? And my dad was like, yeah, this was on the radio. And we could not <laughs> believe this because the lyrics, they're kind, they're, they're not graphic, but they kind of are. It's just like, I don't just listen to it after this. Your life will be forever changed. But for me, it's become a song that I'll never forget my friend Kate doing the full performance of it. So all of us just thought this is the funniest song of all time. They came down to Nashville, my parents, and then Chris and Kate, these family friends, they came down to Nashville to visit and we were out at a bar and the cover band's playing, whichever, and we're tipping them to play these certain songs. And then she goes, should we request Stroken? And I said, they'll never, ever know that song. Like this is a country bar. They're not playing Clarence Carter. All of a sudden, two hours later, the band starts playing it. And they're like, we know nobody will know the song in the crowd. We're sitting there like, are you kidding me right now? So the <laughs> dance floor clears. We are on the floor, like dancing harder than I have in my entire life. And it was just one of those moments where I just thought, okay, I needed to be with these exact people for this to happen. So now it's become kind of this personal prank of mine. <laughs> I've discovered that once in a while you get this rare gem of a gift in this life where you have the opportunity to connect to someone's Bluetooth speaker without them authorizing it. <laughs> <laughs> like I live in a condo building and there's always Albertans that come in and stay for the weekend and leave or whichever. So once in a while, if I can hear they're having a party and they've got their Bluetooth on, <laughs> I've only done it a few times, but man, has it been a fun time. So what I've been able to do is connect to their Bluetooth and I'm like, oh God, what song do I put on? I will always put on Stroke In by Clarence Carter because it's so <laughs> weird. It's so weird. And people are always just kind of like, what is happening right now? And it's been fun. Like if I'm at a friend's house back when that existed, I will always try to connect to some sort of Bluetooth speaker of theirs and I will play it. It's, it's my song that I try and surprise people with it when they don't expect their music to be taken over with the weirdest track of all time, but it's become like <laughs> such a big part of my heart because it's so funny. But yeah, I highly recommend it. If you ever need to prank someone with any sort of song that's really going to get the people going, it's Stroken by Clarence Carter. So so now our audience knows that if they're walking around, they've got the the, the Bluetooth speakers and their headphones mm. and whatnot, and for some unknown reason, Stroken from Clarence Carter comes <laughs> on, it's Katie. <laughs> It's well, I've Katie. told enough people this, though, that I feel like a few people have taken it for a walk and they've tried it and they're like, man, that's actually really funny. And I'm like, I know. So if, if it's not me, it's one of my people. <laughs> there, there apparently is a stroken cult now. <laughs> God, I don't want to be the leader of the stroken cult. <laughs> or we'll call it the stroken squad and just, you know. <laughs> How about we say the Clarence Carter cult? <laughs> I don't Cla need to have stroken in the name of that. Clarence Cl Clarence Carter revival. There we go. Yes. 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 The true CCR <laughs> Clarence Carter revival. Ah, <laughs> uh, storyteller, survivor, and beacon of inspiration, Katie Caldwell. Thank you so much for this. Where can we find you on social media? And where can we just send you random audio clips of stroken? <gasps> that is a great question. Please send the audio clips of stroken and just give me your review of the song. I just want to hear people's thoughts. Um, you have to play it loud. That's my only rule. So I, across all the boards, um, my handle is at Katie Loris. It's confusing because it's my middle name. So a lot of people don't know if my name is Katie Loris or Katie Caldwell. My name is Katie Loris Caldwell. But when you have a very basic and generic name, you can't use Katie Caldwell and handles. So it is at K-A-T-I-E-L-A-U-R-I-S-S -S, at Katie Loris. Katie, thank you so much for this. This has been the Made You a Mixtape podcast with RO2 Clarence Carter. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, you can listen to us on all audio streaming services. If you are listening to us on an audio streaming service, you can watch this full interview on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter at the MYAM podcast. My name is Jason. Katie, thank you so much. We will see you next week or listen to you next week. Take care.